There are two very important characteristics for determining if a sugar is good or bad for you, and that is the source of the sugar and its biochemical composition that you just alluded to. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, your show host. Today's guest is Dr. John Lewis. Dr. Lewis earned his BS in business administration from the University of Tennessee, his MS in exercise physiology, also from the University of Tennessee, and then his PhD in education and psychological studies from the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. In the 90s and early 2000s, he grew in rank at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in various areas of research. I tracked him down in 2014 to find out more about his study titled The Effect of Allopolymanos Multinutrient Complex on Cognitive and Immune Functioning in Alzheimer's Disease. At the time, I was trying to learn all I could about aloe vera, and it bothered me that someone 50 miles away probably knew more about it than I did. Enjoy the show. I'm going to scare people away right from the beginning. I'm going to discredit ourselves by saying, today, we're going to be talking about why sugar is so good for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's get exactly. it out there, right? Healthy sugars. That's going to be the topic that we discuss today. And, you know, I also, I gave your introduction before I saw you here. I already recorded it. And I kind of skimped on it because if I gave you a righteous introduction, I would have used a bunch of big words that really don't mean a whole lot to us simple folk because you're one of those guys with the white coat. I was almost going to wear my coat, my white coat, just to try to make me feel like I'm at your level. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not but that special. <laughs> you're you're one of those guys that's spent time in the lab and we kind of convince ourselves that certain things are good for us because we do what we think is research. You know, we go to Google and we type in some terms and we look things up and find something on Google and we say, oh yeah, that justifies, you know, that this is healthy for me or whatever the case is. But that is not research. That's a Google query. And nowadays we're getting AI delivering yeah. answers that are based on things that people wrote and none of it That's is right. real or none of it is fact-checked, or none of it is based on real science. Some of it might right. be, but we can't trust it unless it's real science. Totally agree so, with you 100%. And let me back up too, because I actually tracked you down about 10 years ago because of your study, and this is a crazy title. The title by itself tells you enough about Dr. John Lewis. The effect of an allopolymanos multinutrient complex on cognitive and immune functioning in Alzheimer's disease. If you're able to follow that title, hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> we should probably start there. That'd be great. What was that study about? That study... <clears throat> was and still is today the most rewarding scientific effort I ever endeavored in in my entire life. And we started that study with the idea of being able to help people, as you know, the tragedy of Alzheimer's disease. And even nearly 20 years ago, when we first were able to get funding from a generous family who allowed us to do the study even. I mean, as you know, NIH, Alzheimer's Association, all these big bureaucracies, they may talk publicly about their interest in nutrition, but when the rubber hits the road, it's all about pharmacology and maybe genetics, right? That's where they're looking to support research to create 
some licensing agreement that then they can turn around a few years later and make millions or billions of dollars off of. And with nutrition, that potential is not there. So it was only thanks to a lady who heard Dr. McDaniel, my dear colleague and friend, giving a lecture about his work, anecdotal work with some people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And then she and her husband uh, formed a really good relationship with Dr. McDaniel. He was not affiliated with any university at that time. And he called me up one day and he said, John, we have a great opportunity to conduct a study with people with Alzheimer's disease using the allopolysaccharides. And I said, I'm game, let's go for it. As we were planning the study and we, th we were thinking about the patient group that we wanted to really investigate, it became very obvious to us in looking at things at that time, and it's still true today, that Big Pharma had no interest in studying people with mild dementia or newly diagnosed dementia. I'm sorry, with <clears throat> moderate to severe dementia, it was only, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. It was only people with either mild dementia or newly diagnosed dementia or mild cognitive impairment, something at an earlier or mild stage. The people at the moderate to severe stage were the people that Big Pharma had no interest in. That was true then, it's still true today. So we chose you know, in our, in our view or in our goal of trying to help people, we wanted to focus on the people who needed the most help and who were essentially the most neglected subgroup of this particular patient population. And so here at the University of Miami, here in South Florida in general, and you, you live here too, you know, there were so many older people here that have, you know, we clearly have a, a very large group of people of demographic in this part of Florida that are already dealing with the disease or at greater risk of the disease compared to other states in the country. And so it was a you know natural setup for us to be able to, to run this study here. And so <clears throat> again, as we are designing the study, we also want to take into consideration that due to the level of impairment of these particular patients, we wanted to make sure that we gave the study sufficient time for people to have a response. In other words, a lot of the studies I've conducted in my career have been for 30 days or 60 days or maybe 90. And, and unfortunately, typically that's also driven by your budget. Like it's, you know, it's always driven and, and limited by your budget in terms of how much you can really add bells and whistles to your research design. But in this case, we had about $150,000, which is not an insignificant amount of money, but it's also not millions of dollars either where we can do a lot of elaborate things. And so we chose to do. And, and if I might interject, sure. the reason for that would be because it's somehow privately funded. It's not funded by big pharma because they don't really have anything to gain. That's from right. When you're studying something that's more food oriented, so to speak, as opposed to something that, you know, they can patent and no one can That's compete right. with. Uh, polysaccharides can actually be found in food sources. And of course, if they put it in a pill, people are going to say, well, why don't you just eat the food? Right. Or some form of it. Absolutely. And so 150,000 actually is substantial considering where it's coming from. And it's also what hinders us from being able to, you know, legitimize the use of certain food substances for things because Big Pharma is going to say, hey, without the proper studying, they're going to lobby and make sure that we're not allowed to compete with that's them. Right. <clears throat> so it's an interesting dynamic. So I would say that's actually a, a, a sizable for this kind of study. No question about it. I mean, I, I've conducted other studies with 20 and 30 and $40,000. So <laughs> you can imagine, you know, pinching pennies and nickels and dimes on that type of budget. So we did have a little more flexibility in our ability to run a longer design of a 12 month intervention to do a very sophisticated battery of cytokines, growth factors, all the different subsets of the immune system. Unfortunately, we were not able to collect blood at three, six, and nine months, but we had the blood collected at baseline in 12 months. And then we had a neuropsychologist who 
conducted all of the neurocognitive assessment at baseline three, six, nine, and 12 months. And plus we were able to pay for all of the, the product too with that money. So we had money to pay for staff. We had money to pay for all the assessments, money to pay for the study supplements. So we had, I agree with you. I mean, we had, it was a, a very nice budget that typically in my work at, at the University of Miami, I, I didn't have, you know, again, millions of dollars in grants that some people get for these silly studies that are about things that never even see the light of day or never even really translate into making a difference in people's lives. But what was even more fascinating about this study when we first began, so Dr. McDaniel and the lady, the husband didn't come, but the wife came both uh, from the Dallas area. They flew into town and she wanted to see the center. You know, of course she wanted to see where her money's being spent. And I didn't mention that she and her husband had had four family members die of Alzheimer's. And that was why for them, it was really personal. I mean, they weren't just submitting money to this because, oh, well, yeah, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading killer of Americans. No, they had four family members die from the disease. So they were already personally very touched and affected by how devastating this disease is. So <clears throat> she and Dr. McDaniel come to town. And we're meeting with like the staff psychiatrist and the coordinators and the psychologist and some of these other people. I kid you not at the meeting, the psychiatrist and I, you know, I don't want to kick a dog and I won't mention the man's name. If somebody's interested, I'll, I may tell it later, but this guy literally tells us, Dr. Haley, well, you know, you guys have some money. We see a lot of patients here at the center who are in that level of severity you're looking for. So we've got plenty of opportunity to recruit for you. But quite frankly, we do pharmacology research here. And, you know, he said it with kind of this attitude. We do pharmacology research here. And I don't think your nutrition is going to do anything. <laughs> I looked at Dr. Reg and I looked at Ms. Brazil. I'm like, what? You know, it was like that. What? <laughs> We, we, we've been programmed in this medical system and, you know, it, it, be, it began, you know, what, in the yep. 30s and 40s when, uh, you know, I, I guess the Carnegie's were involved in the Flexner report right. and, and they started programming the way these medical schools were going to operate and you either complied or lost accreditation and your school That's became right. worthless. And it was programming drugs, 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 right. drugs, drugs. And it's really the fault of the medical system. And they come out of school and that's what they actually believe. He was brainwashed and programmed and that's what that's right. he believed. It is what it is. And I should tell you and your listeners too, since maybe this is the first time some of your listeners will hear this story before, Dr. McDaniel is a trained pathologist. He, at the time he and I met, he was already about 20 years into his journey of the polysaccharide story. But 20 years before that, in the late, mid to late 1980s, he had, and I'm sorry for being tangential about the story of the study, but this is very important context. Dr. McDaniel in, in, in the mid to late 80s was running a pathology unit in Dallas, had been, you know, a conventional pathologist up to that point, his whole career had real no, no real interest in nutrition, just doing his thing, running his pathology unit. And he has eight guys come to his office one day who are taking this aloe vera product. They're HIV positive, but they're taking this aloe vera product. They have no viral load and their CD4 cells are normal. He thought he was being pranked. He thought this was some kind of a joke, you know, maybe a colleague or a friend was pulling on him. Thankfully for all of us, they did not take no for an answer. It finally got him to look at this product. He tried to get some of his physician friends. He went to medical school at University of Te Texas Southwestern, one of the top public, at least public, maybe including private medical schools in the country, you know, obviously huge reputation couldn't get any of his physician friends interested, but he had several friends at Texas A&M at the vet school. And of course, the typical veterinarian is more interested in nutrition than the typical physician. And it ended up leading them down this road of research on why these polysaccharides were so darn effective. 
And it just completely changed the man's life. And so he went from the trained pathologist with no interest in nutrition to actually leaving the field of pathology and practicing nutrition. And then fast forward, you know, 20 years later, wow. he and I meet, we start this friendship and collaboration. We run these studies together. He said later he went to an alumni meeting after, you know, we'd published some of these papers and he'd done all this stuff already prior to meeting me. But he said his dean actually came up to him and said, Reg, you are the biggest embarrassment of our entire medical school. So to your point about how the brainwashing and the propaganda is so strong with these, you know, conventional medical people, yeah. uh, poor Reg, I mean, this man has done, and he just turned 88 this year. He still works every day, still goes to his office, just like you and me, still fighting the good fight to help people. And yet the medical establishment has such a profound, yeah. it's almost like hatred, right? I mean, it just, because it's not within their dogma, they don't recognize it. They don't appreciate it. They don't value it to the point where his colleagues make fun of him. His dean told him he was an embarrassment. I mean, just all kinds of nasty things that this man has been told and said to that he does not deserve because all he has ever done is help people in his entire life. And I'm just very grateful that somehow God, the universe, what it, you know, whatever fate, luck, just whatever you want to call it, brought us together through a mutual contact at the University of Miami about 20 years ago. And that was how it changed my entire life, because I didn't know anything other than what I had learned about saccharides in a biochemistry lecture or two many, many years before that as a student, <laughs> that they were basically a fuel source for the cells. But beyond that, I had no clue, <laughs> quite frankly. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to send a link of this podcast to Dr. Wesley Calvin. He's in the, well, he's in Key West and he's winding his practice down. He's a naturopath, but it was about the, I don't know if it was late seventies or early eighties when he had eight patients with HIV. And I'm not sure about the amounts, but I think he had them drinking two glasses. I could be wrong of aloe okay. a day and all eight of them became uh, undetectable, uh, HIV undetectable, which is, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no virus there. It just means it, it's, you know, as if it wasn't there. And that was, that was in the scary time because medications weren't available yet to treat HIV and people That's were right. dying. It was a very scary time. And yet here he found that aloe vera was an answer or a benefit at the time. I can't say an answer. I can't right. say a cure. Um, because it hasn't been studied enough, That's right? But well, we because it's a food and no one's going to fund exactly. it exactly. Well, and I felt like it was important before we went further discussing the study to talk about Reg's history and he and I meeting, and then how it completely changed my life and my career. And so I owe Reg a huge debt of gratitude in terms of how he influenced me and in my life and my career. But it was just, you know, it, it's such an interesting juxtaposition between who he was, you know, again, graduating medical school and then just kind of following that path and then being changed so dramatically, literally like a 180 degree change into a completely different person, what he thought was true and all these other sorts of things. And then how that impacted me later. But when we we're dealing with this psychiatrist. We kept our composure. We didn't like go ballistic or anything. We just said, okay, well, you know, if that's your belief, that's fine. You know, whatever we, <laughs> we're not going to try, you know, we're not here to convince you. We'll let the data speak for themselves. And you know, all the better because now he's not trying to make something happen. That's right. Or fudge results or anything like that. All, all the more he's trying to prove that he's right. That's he wants right. to show you. I told you so. That's human nature. And here's an interesting thing again, and I hate to call him out. I mean, he's not a bad guy. He just doesn't, he's got the blinders on, you know, like most typical psychiatrists. I mean, they're probably the most extreme in the medical profession when it comes to writing prescriptions in terms of any other type of specialty. So it took. I, I once was blind, but that's now right. I see, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
It could happen. That's it can right. happen to anyone. So because of the length of the intervention, um, and of course, again, not having just millions of dollars or and not even actually a money constraint, it was more of a staff constraint because there were other studies going on at the same time. And so you only have, you only have enough manpower to do what you can do every day. We couldn't enroll just like a hundred people all at once and then start assessing them. So we had to sequentially enroll people over about a, I think about a six or eight month period. And we ultimately got up to about 34 people. And then we decided, okay, based on our numbers and what we can pay for, this is probably about as many as we can afford to enroll. And then it took us about two and a half years from the point of starting to enroll people to the last person who completed his or her 12 month follow-up. So that took again, about a two and a half year period. Interestingly about, it was not even within the first eight or nine months. It might've been about the first six months. I get a call from the psychiatrist one day. So this is after the first wave or two of people have already been enrolled. They've had a few assessments. He calls me up one day and he goes, John, if I hadn't been part of this study myself, I would not have believed what I'm seeing here. He had to admit that he was starting to see changes in these people at the cognitive level that he had never, never would have believed if he had not been somehow involved in diagnosing the people and making sure they were, excuse me, appropriate for the study. You enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. All right. So obviously, we're going to hear about a positive outcome on this study. What was the actual product that you used at the time? We used, um, so we used an aloe polysaccharide based dietary supplement that had some other things in it. It had rice bran in it. It had flaxseed in it. Um, it had N-acetylcysteine, tart cherry, dioscoria, a little bit of citric acid and ultra terra clay. Uh, what am I leaving out? Some sunflower lecithin and you know, it had okay. a few other things. And, and you know, lecithin is essentially to, for the texture right, the and some of these things are, you know, we're, we're, we're preserving it. The main um, active component or beneficial component that we're looking, and you could look at flax and you could say, well, healthy omega-3s, that could contribute to some things. Um, but really, what we're really studying is the effect of this that's sugar right. complex. I'm, I'm, I'm dumbing That's down right. the name of it for the sake of making uh, relatable to those people listening because it's a sugar complex. We're going to talk about what that is um, in, in a little more detail real soon. But you would say the if we were to summarize it now, the results, how positive were they? Well, Dr. Haley, let's put it this way. After <clears throat> you know doing the analyses, running the statistics, and looking at, I mean, we were st- even though we had all this data in the blood, we were most excited and mo- most interested in the cognitive function data. So, for those of you who don't work with neurocognitive assessments, the ADAS Cog is widely considered to be not according to our opinion. This is from other people that work in cognitive assessment. It is considered to be the gold standard for assessing cognitive function, particularly among people with any form of dementia. And that's been published for, gosh, decades and thousands of studies. And so, and that was the uh, tool that the the neuropsychologist at the center always used. That was what she used for helping them with diagnosis and then just tracking people over time. Remember, we collected it baseline three, six, nine, and 12 months. So five assessments. At the nine and 12 month assessment periods, 
we showed clinically and statistically significant improvements in cognitive function. That's unheard of. In any... Right, because normally they're right, going, they're the going other down. Way. They're continuing to decline until death. That's unheard of. And I want to make sure people understand the difference between clinically and statistically significant, because not only is that a mouthful, but that's also, what the heck does that mean? So you can have large numbers. And again, a sample size of 34 is a pretty good number. It's not thousands, but it's a pretty good number. It's not 15 either. You can have really large numbers in a study and of you know people, objects, assessments, whatever. The law of large numbers will say that just because you have hundreds or thousands of assessments or time points or data points, you will find statistical significance, meaning we typically use this threshold of 0.05%, meaning a one in 20 chance of something just occurring by chance. But does it have any clinical or practical value? That's the difference between something that's statistically significant, but not clinically or practically meaningful. On the ADAS-COG, if you have a change in the score in either direction, good or bad, of four points or greater, that is deemed clinically meaningful, meaning that it actually has practical value to the person's life. And that's what we showed at nine and 12 months. And I always get chill bumps every time I tell this little story, because for me, it's great to be an ethical, good scientist. You work hard, you spend the money the way you're supposed to, you're ethical and treating people the way that you're supposed to. But you do all this work and maybe it never does anything. It never sees the light of day. It never provides any benefit to people. But when you could, man, when you can actually help people, like when you can actually improve the quality of life of somebody dying from this horrible, nasty disease, wow, that's where the rubber hits the road. And again, I had caregivers during the study calling me up in tears, telling me their loved one was talking about memories, anniversaries, birthdays, people's names, places, events, things that they had not talked about in some cases for years. Again, it gives me chill bumps. The yeah. oldest lady we had in the study was 93, I think, in enrollment. She had had this awful disease, I believe, for 11 or 12 years. The most impaired person in our study, she sat in a wheelchair and she did not talk. That was her life. She came into the center Monday through Friday for socialization, for whatever that was worth, but sat in a chair all day and did not talk. We enrolled her in the study because, as you can imagine, her caregiver, I, I think it was a grandson or a granddaughter, her caregiver was so desperate to try to find something for that grandmother just to give some little modicum of quality of life back. Between... Baseline, when she started taking our product, somewhere between then and the three-month assessment, one day she came into the center and she walked in and she called one of the coordinators by his first name. He started crying like a baby. It was so emotionally powerful and moving cool. for him that he literally just cried. And again, I, I, got, I have hair standing up all over me. It just... It brings chills to me when I talk yeah. about this stuff because it's great to be a good scientist and do your job and conduct science ethically and properly. But when you can actually touch people's lives like this, it's just on another level. And, you know, before we, we talk about what these, you know, specialized sugar molecules are, these super complex carbohydrate molecules, we talked about pot having positive results. What is the amount of uh, product that someone would have to consume a day? And might the results have been better given more than they had gotten in the study? Great question. And, you know, being out of academics now for a few years and, and trying to work with people as much as I can to efficiently and accurately help people. And I take people as much as I can on a case by case basis. What we've learned over time is that most people will actually respond very well to somewhere between 500 milligrams up to maybe two grams per day of the polymannose or the acetylated polymannan or the ACE mannan. As you know, there are several synonyms for it. So when you look at it in the context of macronutrition of 
2,500 or how many ever calories somebody's eating per day. And you think, wow, this material is so potent that you only need a few hundred milligrams or maybe a gram or two per day to get boom, that kind of effect. That's man, that's like really powerful. So as you consume more, there's probably a point of diminishing returns. It's probably not going to harm you. It won't you harm you, clearly. A little extra. But and that's a good question. I mean, as you know, I'm out of the business of asking government and foundations and even individuals for money to do research. But one of my goals. Yeah, well, and the reason I say, because, you know, if I'm having a, a challenge and I know that uh, 500 milligrams is kind of a top end of benefit, I might take double that just Absolutely. to make sure. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, because it's harmless. What's your theory on how it worked? Was it, you know, improving gut health so that the gut was absorbing more nutrients from all the food? Is it increasing blood flow? How, what was that? What do you think the mechanism of the benefit was? I can tell you what we published and then I can add the two points you just mentioned definitely are part of it. We didn't study either, um, you know, anything related to the microbiome or anything related to like vasodilation or anything like that. But clearly through other research, we know those are effects that happen with these polysaccharides. But what we showed at the cellular physiological level were several things. Number one, the CD4 to CD8 ratio is our ratio. Uh, for those of you not really that familiar with immunology, we have all these different components of our immune system. And so the CD4s are our helper cells. Those are the cells that actually try to do things to help other parts of the immune system function properly and recognize where there's damage or infection. So those are a very important subset of our helper cells. I'm sorry, of our immune cells. And then we have our cytotoxic cells. And those are cells that are a bit more specialized in the sense of being able to recognize, hey, there's an infection, there's a virus, there's a bacteria, or hey, there's a damaged dying cell. Let me go after that thing and eliminate it so that it doesn't cause us more problems. So those are very important components of our immune system that work in balance with each other. And this CD4 to CD8 ratio has been shown to be very important over time, not just for people with Alzheimer's, but for all of us. And we showed a nice increase in that ratio over that 12 month period. Um, two proteins, called TNF-alpha and vascular endothelial growth factor have been studied more historically in uh, different forms of heart disease and different types of cancers. Our paper was probably the first study that documented how those two markers changed over a period of time in response to a dietary supplement. We lowered both. We know that we need certain amounts of TNF-alpha and vascular endothelial growth factor. Those proteins are very important for just normal physiological functioning. But when you get too high of either one, those high values are related to, again, chronically cancer and heart disease and even other things. But our paper was the first, again, showing how you could lower these things to help improve this, let's call it this sort of general or global inflammatory status. So it's like a marker of chronic inflammation, which Again, we know that chronic inflammation is tied to all these different chronic diseases, not just neurodegeneration. And then adult stem cell production. I didn't mention that the average age of our people, of our subjects in the study, was 79.9 years of age, almost 80 years of age. So we're talking very old, very sick folks that didn't just have Alzheimer's. They also had diabetes, <laughs> depression, different forms of heart disease. We actually turned on... There's a there's a, a subset of adults. I, I'm laughing a little bit because a lot of the people that are listening to this are that age, <laughs> and you just called them very old. <laughs> and I, I'm getting well, pretty I'm right close. Behind, so. I'm right there okay. with you. I mean, I guess you could say we could only be so lucky to live to that age, right? Like, there's something to be said for even uh, attaining that age. But the CD4, yeah, but. It's getting, it, you know, it's getting younger and younger all the right. time, you know, and especially the closer we get to it. But, you know, we are learning things like the benefits of the mucopolysaccharides and we are, you know, living healthier and better and stronger That's than right. ever before. So it's, uh, it, it certainly used to be old. I don't think That's it right. is anymore. I, I saw my father uh, yesterday or the day before 
And, you know, he's 80 years old and he's golfing all the oh, time awesome. and exercising on the beach. And he's got his morning routine and riding his bikes. And, you know, uh, you can be very, very active and healthy and very witty <laughs> late into your 80s, 90s, over That's 100. Right. So, well, the, the, so the CD14 cells, again, is one of the markers that can be monitored for your adult stem cell production. And there's other research that shows that CD14s actually can become neurons. So that's one of the cells that also is looked at in this model of neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to regenerate parts of it. And so we showed in our study. Yeah, and I, I, I wanna pause just for a second there because for a lot of people, that's a big word. What's a stem cell? And are you saying that that stem cell can grow into a new neuron? So stem cells are <clears throat> one of the reasons, as you know, that we are alive every day and we're able to go through the lifespan or the health span, hopefully more appropriately, is because our body has the capacity to regenerate itself. The immune system makes these stem cells where it has this inherent intelligence gifted to us through a higher power or the universe, whatever you choose to believe in. And these stem cells have the ability to migrate to different parts of our body and then turn into that particular cell. So neuroplasticity is this concept 30 or 40 years ago. I'm not sure when the shift occurred in the field of neurology, but it was once thought that you were born with a certain amount of neurons or brain cells, and that was it. That was all you had. And so if you became a big alcohol drinker and did drugs and did other things, you were damaging your brain and your brain had no capacity to regenerate itself. But finally, people got smart in their ability to figure out how to study the brain and look at it just like any other organ. And it was determined that, hey, wait a minute, the brain can actually, the hippocampus, other parts of the brain can actually regenerate and restore itself depending on what uh, part of it you're looking at. And so these CD14 cells have been shown to have the capacity to turn into neurons. And we showed in our study from baseline to 12 months that the CD14 cells increased their production just under 300%. I think it was like 286 or 7%. So imagine, and, and I didn't mention that as we age, of course, like so many other things, our ability to produce glutathione, our ability to absorb protein, all these other things that happen to us, our telomere shortening, just like everything else, our capacity to create stem cells also unfortunately declines. But we showed with our polysaccharide, this dynamic sugar, that with this nutritional complex, we can actually get the body to turn that capacity back on again. And for us, I mean, when you put this entire picture together, you have increasing adult stem cell production, lowering of inflammation, boosting the overall immune system's functioning, it all made perfect sense to us why these people actually had improvement in cognitive functioning. I mean, there's no, there were really no better data at the cellular level to support that clinical or practical change other than if we had had the funding to do imaging of the brain and actually look at the morphology or the changes in the brain. And that's what I hope to do in a subsequent study when I have funding to do another clinical trial. But Short of actually looking at the brain with imaging, that was the best theory or the best working model that we came up with in terms of why these folks started thinking again and started recalling memories again and started being able to say, hey, wait a minute, I remember you and I remember what we did five years ago and these kinds of things. So just incredible results that we had from this clinical trial. And I think it's also a good time, as I'm, I'm sure you've had many discussions with other hosts about this is, you know, we never use the terminology of treating, curing, managing, mitigating disease with nutrition, right? I mean, that's a very significant FDA claimer we're all supposed to adhere to. And so for me and Dr. McDaniel and our colleagues, we always talk about this in the context of using nutrition to Science. support cellular functioning, right? Like <laughs> it's not treating disease, it's providing the raw materials yeah. that the cells need to function properly. And that's a far different paradigm than using pharmacology that alters a metabolic pathway with one chemical to treat a symptom of a disease, a completely different paradigm. Yeah, we're, we're doing the things that our body needs for optimal health. And that's right. some of these things are backed by 
science and we can share the science with you. It's not a cure for Alzheimer's. However, science shows a benefit. Now, we still haven't talked about the sugars, okay? Right. And so this is your new product. It's a canister of sugar, right? right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) No, we'll go into some details. Okay. We'll go into some details, but, uh, I'm kind of feeling the the need right now for a little. I just had my dose a little while ago. So I've got your product here. Beautiful. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the easy uh, way out here and just do a little quick mix. There we go. And this is how easy it is to get these products now, but there's other ways too. We'll talk about the sources of what's in this. It's pretty tasty. It's not (laughs) Kool-Aid. It's not vanilla ice cream. You know, no, <laughs> but knowing the source, uh, you know, eating the food directly is going to have a bit of, um, you know, and there is flax right. in there too, yes. right? Yeah, because I'm tasting a little bit of that. Interesting. Now, b- because not everybody likes to taste things and you can't overdose, there's yes. another option. So what's a normal serving? Four capsules. Okay. Well, I got six or seven. Oh, well, let's see if we can do this in once. And they're the normal size capsules. They're not the the larger ones. They're the the typical size that most dietary supplements in capsule form are that you'll find. I just washed down six or seven. So I'm getting (laughs) a little insurance. That's right on my brain health. And I got to finish this too. Now, what's the difference between these two products besides one's in capsule and one's in a scoop? There's no, there's no difference. It's just that to your point of, you know, the taste and the, even the texture for some people, uh, we ran this, this trials in Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis with a powder knowing that certain people with neurodegeneration will have issues swallowing. And so we felt like for that population, even with MS too, I mean, even though they're not quietly, quite severely as affected with swallowing as people with dementia are, that we felt it would be easier for people to take a powder simply because you can mix it with basically anything. The only thing I tell people not to mix it with is anything of very high heat. So you don't want to damage the nutrients with boiling or near boiling liquid. But other than that, juice, smoothies, applesauce, mashed potatoes, oatmeal, cereal. Uh, I even have people that like to mix it in their coffee and tea. I just say, you know, make sure it cools down a little bit, but I'm not a coffee drinker, so I I can't go there. Yeah, that could actually go good. Yeah, but I, I like putting it in my smoothie. You never taste it. I mean, if depending on, you know, if you're more of a, like a green smoothie person versus a fruit smoothie person, you'll, you'll still never taste it either way, but. It would definitely be tasty mm -hmm. in a smoothie. And I, yeah, you you really wouldn't taste it or it just might taste a little healthier. And, okay. And as far as the capsule go, it's just taking the same formulation, sticking it in a capsule. So that way for people, again, that don't like the taste or the texture, It's in a capsule and obviously more convenient for traveling if you don't like making a mess with a powder or something, if you, you know, have it. Now, you can't get that much into a capsule. So is it is the four capsules coming to the same serving size? Yes, exactly. So that thank you for asking that. So that was my next point. Four capsules are roughly one scoop of the powder. You know, it's not an exact um, equivalence, but they're it's close. I'm Dr. Haley interrupting this podcast to share this month's special at HaleyNutrition.com. Use the coupon code S2024. That's S2024 for $25 off your purchase of $200 or more now through the end of September 2024. If you haven't tried the Aya Greens vegetable and fruit powder yet, you're missing out each scoop of powder has the antioxidant equivalent of more than 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. 
You're going to love them. They taste great. You're going to feel great. You're going to be full of energy. Head over to HaleyNutrition.com and add a canister of greens to your cart today. Now back to the Dr. Haley Show podcast. All right, let's talk about these special sugar molecules and how are they different than glucose yes. or fructose or lactose or galactose yes. or all the you know common sugars that we're familiar with. So the psychologists refer to something called the teachable moment. I don't know if you utilize that little nugget, if you will, as a method with your patients or customers, but the teachable moment just basically means, you know, somebody comes upon some new information, they're hearing someone talk about something, and then it's an opportunity where you can take something that that person had never heard of and utilize it for that person's benefit, ultimately, when they're open-minded and willing to receive it. So I don't know how many decades now we've been hearing the mass media tell us Anytime they mention something about sugar, you know, sugar, the first thing the average American thinks of is bad. Oh, this is bad for me, right? Like you just, we're already conditioned to think sugar equals bad. There's no opportunity to think of it in a different context. So the thing that my teachable moment for people is I always like to say, it doesn't matter that you've heard this because Sugars are not sugars. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are two very important characteristics for determining if a sugar is good or bad for you. And that is the source of the sugar and its biochemical composition that you just alluded to. And so high fructose corn syrup is a monosaccharide or mono simple sugar, saccharide sugar. I think we can pretty much all agree that if you're eating high fructose corn syrup every day, you're spiking your glucose, you're spiking your insulin, you're creating all of these oxidative, inflammatory metabolic cascades that will not be to your benefit and eventually you're gonna pay the consequences of it. So that's a very easy form of simple sugar for that most people have heard of, especially those of you drinking soda or some of these other things that are using that as their foundation ingredient. Then you have disaccharides like sucrose or white table sugar. It's a little more complex di meaning two, so it's got two glucose units attached together by a bond that makes it a little bit more complex. And then finally, you have these polysaccharides, poly meaning many, complex saccharide sugar. So you have these complex many sugars that are strung together, literally hundreds of glucose units strung together by these beta glycosidic bonds. And they are so dense in information that it's impossible to draw these things on a piece of paper. They're literally like 5D images. And when you look at it from that level, and especially from the ones close to your heart and close to my heart, from aloe vera, they are arguably the most beneficial sugar that Mother Nature provides for us for any type of a health or healing or health promoting benefit. These things are so dynamic so loaded with information compared to an amino acid or a fatty acid, certainly a vitamin or a mineral, very simple structures, that they have all of this coded information that our genes, and remember our genes, if you use the analogy of a gun, a gun doesn't do anything until you load it with ammo and pull the trigger. The gene is kind of the same way. It really doesn't do anything until it receives information from the environment. And all that information that's coded in those acetylated polymannans are exactly the reason why we, the theory is, is that these things then tell the cells how to function properly. And this is the reason why these things are so, gosh, just, you know, so dynamic and so effective and so efficacious. And so again, please, everyone be mindful of this term, sugar. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Be mindful of the language. Anytime you hear some so-called expert talking head in the media, you know, mentioning sugar and how bad it is for you, say, yeah, but wait a minute. There are different types of sugars and not all sugars are created equally. And it depends on the source and it depends on the biochemical structure. So I want all of our listeners to appreciate that and, and recognize that in my opinion, this is my opinion, that I would put aloe vera, not just the work that we've conducted in our laboratory, but really the entire body of work of scientists and investigators around the world. When you look at all the dynamic effects that have been demonstrated by aloe vera's polysaccharides, 
man, I mean, what else compares to it? Rice bran's amazing. We've looked at a lot of research in rice bran as well. Curcumin is obviously amazing. Ginger. I mean, there are lots of plants that give us such incredible healing benefits, but I would put the polysaccharides from aloe vera at the top of the list. Yeah, I agree. You know, I understand that when you give it to a diabetic, it would actually lower their blood right. sugar levels, that's not right. raise it. And I'm assuming that's in type two diabetes. I don't know about type one. I, well, but we, no, I was yeah, just going to say ahead. Dr. McDaniel, again, you know, there are so many studies that we would love to do. I mean, if we just had more money than we had common sense, we would have already had so many other clinical trials running. Dr. McDaniel has had multiple t type one diabetics actually completely get off their insulin taking these polysaccharides type one not type two type ones yeah. and the type twos i mean all sorts but to, just to your point have had all sorts of nice anecdotal responses to type twos in fact there is a set of data sitting at the air force base in san antonio i don't know i forget the name of the air force base but there was a physician working there with dr mcdaniel about 20 years ago 15 years ago around the time he and I met and Dr. Purcell uh, was working with the servicemen and women and their spouses, anybody that had diabetes. And it was not a controlled study like our clinical trial. It was more of a loose observational study, but he would put anybody who wanted to take the polysaccharides on that formula and then monitor them. And this guy documented incredible results from the people who were taking the polysaccharides versus the people who were not. Dr. McDaniel and I, we contacted a general, we tried to submit a freedom of information request. We tried to do everything our, our, we could to get our hands on these data, to analyze them and try to get a paper out of it. We got stonewalled at every opportunity. We never could come up with the information, but there's an amazing rich data set sitting somewhere in the Department of Defense's computers that if we had that data, we could actually show great proof of how much it helps people with diabetes with taking these polysaccharides. But again, there, you know, along those lines, I understand that there was a study done in like the 1930s or 40s with the sugar molecule mannose, which when you break down these, you know, complex carbohydrate systems, you're looking at the main sugar molecule right. mannose, right. not glucose, mannose. <laughs> But apparently, and I don't know, maybe it was in the form of a dried aloe vera powder or something like that, but they administered it to rats that were in ketosis and the rats remained in ketosis. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. You're telling me, and ketosis means you're in a fat burning right. state. You're telling me that you can give sugar to someone that's in ketosis and they will stay in ketosis. Right. Now, I don't know if it was full uh, blown ketosis or a mild ketosis, but nonetheless, when you're feeding a, a human sugar, <laughs> especially if it's table sugar, they are not going to stay that's in right. ketosis. <laughs> and that's right. <laughs> but if the sugar molecule is mannose, then they probably that's right. will. So it's different. It's different. And that's why we're talking about healthy sugars and not the concept that we have that all sugar is bad. You know, I, there's so many things where we're an hour in, um, I I'm going to wrap it up, but I want to mention a couple things because it was uh, a customer of mine, Dr. Robert Lopinto that mm -hmm. mentioned you and brought you back into my sphere here. When he mentioned you were speaking at the Florida chiropractic association that I think was yes. a couple of weeks ago. How did that event go? It was go? great. I met a lot of really nice people. I had, I had about 20, maybe 25 people come to my lecture and got to connect with some folks who, you know, like so many people that you encounter, like I do, that just have no idea. You think of aloe vera as being something, oh yeah, I've got a sunburn. Let me rub it on my skin. But when you open people's eyes about the polysaccharides and how, when you actually orally consume them and what the benefits potentially are. It's a whole different level of connection with people. So it was a great opportunity once again, to connect with some really nice, interested people. And, and I made some good connections there. Well, I'm glad he mentioned you and it was along the lines of, you know, Dr. Haley, I know you got a great aloe product, 
but this guy's going to be speaking on this and I really think you're going to want to <laughs> attend. And it, you know, he would have talked a little bit like this if he came and approached yes. me at the end yes. of the conference. Um, cause he's got, yeah. you know, he, I think he had a, uh, some kind of throat cancer at some point in time. And okay. So I, yes, I do. Dr. I do remember talking to him. He came up to me very nice and, um, told me about his journey with aloe and how it helped save his life. So it was very, very rewarding to hear his story as well. Very neat. Now, what's a principal investigator? That was kind of in your, you know, bio. What exactly is that? A principal investigator is simply the person who is the lead scientist. You can't be a one-man show as a researcher. It's absolutely impossible. There's no such thing as, you know, just one man or one woman doing every single aspect of running a okay. study. But the so on this particular study, there's a whole bunch of names and yours is first. And that's how I know that you're the principal investigator, right. I would imagine. How many studies have you been the principal investigator? On? Um, about 30. So it's, a, a it's a good number. Okay. And uh, this is a peer reviewed Correct. study. What exactly does that mean? First of all, that means that you run a study you take the data, you analyze it, you say, this seems to have some worthiness for sharing within the scientific community. You write that up with your colleagues, if, you know, if they have the ability to write, and then you pick out a journal. This is not a magazine off the shelf at Walgreens or CVS. Of course, we know magazines aren't what they were prior to the internet. They've been almost destroyed. But this is a peer-reviewed scientific journal that you're only going to find mostly at academic or university libraries, not again at retail stores. And so you take your work, you take your paper, you submit it to that journal. There's a very defined process for how you do that. They have formatting and guidelines and these sorts of things that you have to adhere your manuscript to. You submit that. And then this journal has, a, uh, besides the editor and the co-editor and all those people at that level, they have a whole battery of reviewers, other people like you and me, professionals, scientists, physicians, clinicians, et cetera. And those people are in their bank or in their battery that they will say, here, here's this paper from Lewis and his colleagues. Would you be interested in reading their paper, commenting on it, critiquing it, saying what's wrong with it, what needs to be improved, what needs to be changed or what you like about it? And then you send those comments back to the authors and then they have a chance to respond to those critiques and they can either say, yes, we can address this or no, we can't. And here's why. And you go through that process maybe one time if you're lucky, if the review is not too overly ridiculous or it may take two or three times or you may get just flat out rejected by a journal. You may find somebody that says, no, this is not worthy of publication in this journal. But Regardless, you may go through this a few times, and then at some point, uh, you will eventually get p published, and then you call this a peer-reviewed journal article because, again, it was reviewed by peers, people at a level of scientific knowledge and credibility that can say, yes, I will put my stamp on it for it being worthy of being published in the scientific literature community. It meets, it the, meets scientific the scientific standard. Exactly. Very, very cool. Is there anything you wish that I had asked you? There's so much more we could have talked about and I wanted to. Uh, we might have to do it another time. I know your upbringing and the exercise uh, realm and, and your love for physical yes. fitness and how that got you kind of moving in this direction of nutrition. But what do you wish I asked? Mm. I, you know, you asked the great questions of related to our work in Alzheimer's and, and these polysaccharides. I, I guess you could have asked me a little bit more about our work in multiple sclerosis or maybe talk a little bit more about some of the other details of we've actually published four articles from the Alzheimer's study and three articles from the MS study. So there's a whole host of additional information that if you'd like me to come back on your show anytime, I'd be happy to come back and share more details about the rest of our research that really led to the creation of daily brain care. What I'm thinking, well, MS is a, you know, neurological degenerative That's right. condition. And whether it's in the brain or the spine or wherever it is, I would imagine brain health could be 
central nervous That's system right. health, you know, whether it's MS or, I mean, you can use this probably the same product and just change the That's name. Right. Exactly. <laughs> For a different application. I'm no, sorry okay. I cut you off, but that's just what my brain's no, buddy, thinking okay. right now. I was going to say, one of the questions that other people, other interviewers ask me is, well, John, how did you get from academics to entrepreneur or businessman? And that's a very interesting story because oh. I put it in the context of, you know, going from a very high, you know, just as high as you can be of the paper that we published in 2013 and being so enthusiastic about where that was going to take me for the rest of my career. I had no interest at that moment in leaving academics to then going all the way. I mean, I was not in the Valley. I was actually below it. Like I was so angry and mad of things that again, we can talk about it another time, but it ultimately was well, the beginning of the end of my academic career that led me to going into business. No, I'm glad you did because the reality is, is going into business and making a product is making your research of some benefit otherwise it may have just gotten That's right. lost and you know now it's well what was the whole purpose so um I'm, I'm glad that you're in the business and it's and it's funny for people listening i'm in the aloe business a very similar uh technically you are a competitor your products are competing right. with mine i love you I man love you too and i love your products i love you too right? <laughs> you know it's well hey there's you. a there's thank a you. So there are 8 billion plus people in the world. So the market's not too big for either one of us. So we have a lot of, well, I'm going to continue to take my products. I'm going to continue to take yours. Right, exactly. <laughs> What's the website? Dr. Lewis nutrition.com DR no period Lewis L E W I S nutrition.com. That's where people can find all sorts of articles we've written, all sorts of videos, testimonials, product reviews. There's a whole, host of information on the FAQs. I'm happy to talk to people. You can call us there. You can email us there. Anybody who has questions about anything that they feel the need to speak to me about, I'm happy to help people. All right. Dr. John Lewis. Thank, thank you, Dr. You so Haley. Much. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on the Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com, and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.